And joining us now from Chicago, noted forensic and clinical psychologist, Dr. Daniela Schreier. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us on such an important day for this trial. I first want to ask you, I know you've been watching the testimony. Let's talk about what we just saw. She claims her mother would hit her repeatedly with a wooden spoon she kept in her purse. She said her father would slap her. He would push her into furniture. What is this? Is this abuse or is this discipline? Well, I think in mainstream America, we would say it can count towards abuse. But let me put the psychology hat aside for a second. I grew up with my grandmother, and she gave the wooden spoon to me sometimes, and I needed it, trust me. So I think if you look into reality here, into child protective services and calls that we make on a daily basis, probably, yes, it would be admitted into the database, and hopefully they would follow up. But this is not one of the worst cases that we have actually to have a priority on. There are parents doing much worse things, as a matter of fact, to their uh, children. So I don't think she comes across as very credible. It seems to me that she had a fairly ordinary childhood. Parents actually do often the best they can, and actually children don't come with a blueprint. Did they abuse her in some way, maybe in a legal term? Yes. Was her upbringing different from many others? No, maybe better than many other families. If you have, for example, parents who are drug users or alcohol dependents, very often you see much more violent situations at home, and the children, Jean, do not turn out actually to be aggressive and kill another human being. So how can a defense expert then say that this state of mind that became hers through the hittings with the wooden spoon and the pushing into the furniture led her to then believe that she had to fight for her life? Well, it will be very interesting to behold how they actually built up the case and this story. And also, let me tell you, yesterday when I was watching, even if they want to go to a domestic violence situation, right, or a battered women's syndrome, even what she told us about her former relationships yesterday and today does not amount, in my opinion, to the amount of evidence necessary that she really had developed a post-traumatic stress disorder or anything of this kind. Why, Jean? Because all these relationships before that she chose to be in, she managed also to get out of. She stayed for a while. She noticed the person didn't treat her that nicely. She exited. And she talked more about disguise and the faults all of these guys had rather than about herself. And last but not least, even very recently, she even attacked the last boyfriend that she had, the long-term healthy relationship, in my opinion, that overshadowed everything else. So she showed the capacity to be in a healthy relationship, but the principles that were applied were very different. I do believe that she was not so much emotionally invested in staying with this 20-year-older man. And this is why it worked out very well for her. But then even today, she accused him of being a chain smoker that she didn't like, fine, and he would have been an alcoholic. Well, has she ever met a man that would qualify in her eyes to be normal? Fascinating. You, you can just keep talking and I'll listen. It's so interesting. Let's watch this little bit of testimony from Jody Arias and get your thoughts on this. Jody Arias is testifying why she left her parents' home the first and only time to live with her boyfriend. Why did you leave your parents' home to go live with your boyfriend? Um, I was kind of becoming tired of the discipline, and I was three months until I was 18, and um, one day they um, decided to ground me until I was 18 because I was, I skipped one period in high school because there was a final. All right, so they grounded her. It wasn't physical abuse. It was grounding her. Prosecutor may make a point about that. From the forensic psychologist's point of view, is she believable on the stand at all as she talks in such great detail? 
she sounds coached to me and that's the first problem and secondly i was very disappointed jean yesterday by her performance i thought she would do much better what do i mean by that i think she appeared unbelievable and manipulative and i didn't i didn't see that so much before her um, effect, that's what we see on a person's face, did not match her statements. Generally, people, when they are telling you something and that it's something very sad, you can see they look sad. If it's a happy memory, probably they're smiling. Her affect was very, very flat, and I think it was um, deliberately done. They told her maybe to take out the emotionality, but she came across as very cold. I think it's very separate, and at one time she really had a brief smile flickering on her face, and that was inappropriate. But um, I think she likes the limelight. That is a little bit of the histrionic part that I'm seeing. She likes to be out there, and she likes to tell stories. My problem was when she came up with what I think is a fabricated story about, well, I told the press that I would never be um, actually found guilty because I wanted to kill myself. Well, I saw the clip, Jean, when she gave that statement before that, well, I will never be found guilty. She looked perfect. She had her makeup done, her hair done, and she spoke very self-confidently. She has some self-esteem there. And generally, when you see people who want to kill themselves in the aftermath of having killed a loved one, they look very different. They're distraught especially in the first couple of days after. If they, for example, are found at the crime scene, they come into jail, they're held there, they're under suicide watch because what we know is in the first three, four days, people often snap back and they realize, oh my God, I killed my partner or my ex-boyfriend. And many of them really feel depressed, suicidal, they want to take their own life. I believe she never That's had the intention I believe she never to had kill the herself. intention. That's what you're going to say. Yeah, exactly. To to kill herself. Yeah, and and you know, if we're I running might out make of time, and I want I want you to watch sure. this. Uh, uh, sure, go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, I wanted to make another point. In the normal cases that we see in the suicide, homicide cases, we have maybe two types of aggressive personalities, right? And they say, if you, I can't have you, no one is going to have you, yeah, Jean? But for her, she just killed him, and after that she felt released and went on her way. I do not see her ever wanting to take her own life. All right, very interesting. Now, since we know that she slashed Travis Alexander's throat, almost decapitating him, I want you to watch this from a forensic psychologist point of view and talk to us about it. It's Joey, Jody Arias testifying about the time an ex-boyfriend strangled her. Watch this. Was he physical with you at this, at this acquaintance's home? Um, yes, our argument escalated and he approached me and spun me around and he was very much into martial arts, so he had some kind of hold. I guess it was called a stranglehold. So he started strangling me. And um, just for a few seconds, and then he let go. I almost passed out. I fell on my knees. And um, it kind of made me upset because <laughs> he'd never done that before. So I got up. He started walking away. I got up. And I said something to him like, um, what did I say? Something to the effect of, um, my family would be very upset if they found out what you just did. And then he began to um, describe in detail how he would kill each member of my family. The argument escalated again, and he attacked me again. Not, I don't know how, he jumped on me. And at that point, I was trying to get to the phone to call 911, and he got my arm in some kind of lock and was putting pressure on my forearm, and I thought he might break it, because um, that seemed to be what the goal was. So I managed to grab the phone and I called 911 and he grabbed it out of my hand and hung up. All right, Dr. Daniela, she's describing somebody trying to strangle her. That's her affect in court. Does it just not add up to you? Well, I think I would want to hear the other part of the story. We have always two people telling a story. But I think the entire point mm -hmm. for her making or us uh, believe or telling us that story is that, oh my God, someone attacked me before. I was traumatized. And that's what later on maybe triggered my attack on a Travis. 
I feel that was an outlier that happened to her once. Many battered women live in such situations for years. They fear for her life every single day. They are emotionally abused, sexually abused, and they are financially dependent. They cannot get away. But for her, that happened only one time. So I do not think it's possible for her to actually trigger back to that event and then maliciously and really so heinously killing um, um, Travis so unnecessarily. And that explains the lack of emotion, because a battered woman, someone who's been abused, you would think there would have been some emotion reliving someone trying to strangle you. All right, Dr. Daniela Schreier, clinical and forensic psychologist, joining us from Chicago. Thank you so much.